Hey everybody, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to continue working on our particle system to create an explosion using the new simulation nodes in Blender 3.6.0. So let's jump right into it. Last time, we created some particles that would have some kind of explosive force pushing away from each other, falling with the acceleration due to gravity, and then being deleted when they hit a Z height of zero. And it looked something like this from the side. Let's zoom out a bit and take another look. While this looks all right from the side, let's up the density and see if we can find a slight problem with the way these are being created. Taking the density up to 50,000, I'll run this again. And we can see we're getting a very rectangular shape of distributed points. If we look at it from the top, we can see that this is happening in all three directions. This is due very much to the way that we're creating our random values for our start velocities. Because our random values are very much constrained to this negative and positive space, we end up getting a very square looking random distribution. So let's take another look how we could set our initial velocities based more on the shape of our object rather than the shape of the random box we want these to fill. I'm going to disconnect my random value node from my input. And we're going to populate these values with something a little different. Since we're using the shell of a mesh here to generate our initial points, we can access the normal of the face that they were created on. I can get that here from the normal output of my distribute points on faces node. If I were to plug that directly into velocity and run my simulation, you'd see I would get this. Because each point would have an initial velocity with a length of one pointing away from the face that it was created on. What we'd like to do is if we had a point who had its initial velocity going in this direction, because that's the face normal of the face it was generated on, we would like that point to move in this general direction, but be pointed to somewhere along this curve instead. So we might get this line or this line. Let's see if we can make that work. We have our normal, which was our original center line here. We want to rotate this normal by some amount, keeping the same length. For that, I can use the utilities vector vector rotate node. I'll plug in my normal to the input vector and have my output vector go to my velocity. I'll change the type to Euler. Now we have the vector that we want to change. We want, we tell it what the center point is, that is the center of rotation, so this point here, and then the rotation. We want the position of the center of our rotation to be the position of the point. So we can access that using the position node. And then for our rotation, we're going to have it choose a random value. Now, rotations in Blender are determined in radians. So if we were going to allow this to rotate a whole 90 degrees, that would be pi over 2 radians. As a quick refresher, if we have a circle and we have some vector from the center of that circle to the outside of that circle, and the length of this vector is 1. If we want the distance starting at this point all the way around this circle, that distance is 2 pi. If you're wondering why that is, you can think back to basic geometry. The equation for the circumference of a circle is equal to either pi times the diameter, or 2 times pi times the radius. Well, in this case, my radius is 1. So 2 times my radius is 2, and then 2 times pi gets me all the way around. So this point on the circle is pi. This point is pi over 2, or 1 half of pi. And then down here is 
three halves pi, or 1.5 times pi. Let's go back to our geometry nodes. So if I wanted this to only go a small amount, let's say a 45 degree difference, that would be pi over four. And a 22 and a half degree difference would be pi over eight. Well, we want this to go in both directions. So here I could say negative pi divided by eight. And then here I could just say pi divided by eight. So now I'll get a random rotation of 22 and a half degrees for my original vector. Let's see how that looks. Let's shut off the effect of gravity for a moment so that we can see the difference between just setting a random vector and setting this angled vector. If I were to just set my old random value like I had before, you'll see I get this cube. If I just use the normal, you'll see the points of each plane move straight out but don't separate from the other points within that plane. But now, if I add my vector rotations, you see that the individual faces start to fan out. So to generalize this a bit, we'll add a new input. We'll make it a float, and we'll call it spread. This will be the new value on all three axes for our minimum and maximum. So I'll connect it here to minimum and maximum, but we do want the spread to be negative for minimum and positive for maximum. So I'll add a math node, set it to multiply, and then set this to negative one. So right now, with my spread at zero, this should act as I did when I had the normal going straight in, as it does. But if I start to increase the spread, you'll see that the points start moving in slightly different directions. And the explosion starts to become more and more circular. Now, let's go ahead and turn gravity back on. You'll notice, although we have a better shape now, we've lost some control about directionality. So we can simply add a vector math node between our vector rotate and our velocity, set it to multiply, set all the values to one, and of course nothing will change, but we can now take this and tweak the magnitude of our particle's velocities in each direction. So here, I've increased the magnitude of the Z component of the explosion. Also, I can duplicate this and set it to add, set all these to zero, and now affect the overall direction by adding or subtracting from each vector. So we could reuse our minimum velocity input and plug it into our add and call this add velocity and take our max, plug it into our multiply, and call this scale velocity. You'll want to set the defaults for your add velocity to zero and your scale velocity to one. That way, by default, they're not affecting your explosion at all and you can tweak them for your needs. One more benefit of this method is that you can control the overall shape of your explosions by the shape of your original object. So if I were to remove this bottom face, you'll see that there are now no longer any particles going straight down. And if I lower my spread, that becomes
So now, even though our mesh shape still has a rectangular footprint on it, you'll see we're getting a much more even distribution of the points. Since we're basing this all off the normal values and then just tweaking them with some addition and multiplication, we're still getting a relatively even pulse of particles out of the mesh. We would like some of the particles to have a greater force coming out of the explosion than others. So let's see one way we could do that. If we take the vector that we've rotated, which should be around a length of one, because we were rotating a normal vector, we could go ahead and magnify this using a texture. So we'll want to extend this vector by a certain scale. To do that, we will use a vector math node set to scale. And then we can use a texture node to drive the scale. Let's start with a noise texture and see how that looks. I'll connect my factor to my scale. Let's move about 10 frames in without these to see how it looks. We can see that the outer edge of this is pretty uniform. Let's run this with the noise texture. Here we can start to see it breaking up a bit. Let's try a different texture node to see if we can get some better results. This time, I'm going to use a Voronoi texture. And here, I'm starting to get a lot more interesting results. I could also enhance these values by adding a math multiply node. or perhaps an exponent node. Here we can see we're starting to get some points that are shooting off at much more extreme lengths. Another thing we could do is add a utility math float curve node, and we could use this to help accentuate some of the values. So here, I've used a multiply node and a float curve node to take most of my random textures and keep them with very low values. And then here, boosting the values towards the end. So I get a general cluster in the middle because of these values. And then this small segment gets dispersed quite a bit. Of course, your options here are really quite limitless. You could try mixing different types of textures for the X, Y, and Z components of your vectors. You can add, multiply, mix, really do whatever you want to try to get some interesting shapes. Now that we have a slightly more interesting shape, let's look at one way to add trails to our particles. What we're going to have are two basic types of points. First is going to be our initial points. These are the points that exist at the beginning of our simulation and are at the fronts of our trails. Then next, we'll have the trail points. These ones will be created as we go, and for now, we'll stay in the position at which they were created. Like I've said before, there's probably more than one way to do some of these things that I'm showing you. I'm just trying to give you some ideas to kick off your own creative process. So first I'm gonna need a way to mark my original points as such. So here, coming out of my distribute points on faces node, I'm going to store a named attribute. The type will be Boolean and the name will be original. And the initial value for these points will be true. So coming into the simulation, my points will have this original value tacked onto them. As I said before, only the original points will be moving. So right off the bat, we're going to want to set a condition on our set position node to only move original points. So I'll add a named attribute node. I'll use the original attribute, which is a Boolean, and use that as the selection for my set position. 
At this point, nothing should change because all of our original points are marked as original. Next, on each frame, we want to take a duplicate of each of the original points. So we'll take a branch off of our incoming geometry and create a duplicate elements node. By default, the type is point. So we're good there. And the question is, what do we want to duplicate? Well, we want to duplicate our original points. So I'll take a duplicate of this named attribute node and I'll use it to drive the duplicate elements selection. We're only going to want one copy and now we're going to need to set some information about it. When these get copied, they will be copied with all of the data from the original points. So that'll be things like the original position and things like the radius and the value of the original named attribute. So we will need to alter that. I'll add a store named attribute node. The attribute I want to store is original and the value is going to be false. So all of these duplicates are not going to be marked as original. Therefore, they will not get duplicated later and their position will not be changed. And then I simply want to join those new points with my old points. And I'll use a join geometry node for that. Let's see how that looks. That's looking pretty neat. As just a point of interest, I could use a point, points to volume node, and connect this right before my group output. Let's run the simulation and see how that looks. This will give us a new point on every frame of the animation for every trail. You could, of course, add extra criteria to your duplicate elements node. For right now, it duplicates all of the originals. But you could reduce that by some random amount. If I were to add a Boolean math node, and then a random value node set to Boolean, and connect those together, now I can give it a probability and original. So it'll take all of the original points and then some percentage of them randomly and only duplicate those. So if I drop this to say 30%, you can see that only a few of the trails are actually getting created. Whereas if I bump it way up, you'll see that most of them get created. Another thing you could do is take this initial velocity, bring it into another input, and then bring that straight across to the output. So now this input will stay constant for every frame. I could take this, add a length node, and then say greater than a certain length. So here, any of these points whose initial velocity has a magnitude greater than one is going to get a trail. And if we bump that up to 10, we can see that these inner ones aren't getting trails because the magnitude of their original velocity is less than 10. But these ones that were going faster are getting trails. Like I've said before, the possibilities here are pretty limitless, so I'd suggest you play with them as much as possible. So there it is. I hope you're finding this series helpful, and I hope you learn a thing or two about simulation nodes. I want to give a quick shout out to all my Patreon supporters who are making content like this possible. If you want to join my Patreon, the link for that's down in the description. Again, I hope this inspires you to make something awesome, and until next time, I'll catch you later.